Good morning, church. Praise God that we have opportunity to raise our voice and praise him. We had technical support, I mean technical issue. Uh, 20 minutes ago, we didn't have any sound at all. But hey, if God is for us, who can stand against us? And we couldn't practice our song, but if God is for us, we can still sing. So let's get up and sing and joy now. Our God is for us. The Father's love is strong and mighty forges. Raise your voice now. No love is greater. Who can stand against us? If God is for us, hallelujah. We won't fear the battle, we won't fear the night. We will walk the valley with you by our side. You will go before us, you will lead the way. Separate us, hell and death will not defeat us. He who gave his son to free us holds me in his love. Neither high nor death can separate us, hell and death will not defeat us. He who gave his son to free us. strong and mighty fortress praise your voice now no love is greater who can stand against us if my god is for us sing with joy now the god is for us the father's love is a strong and mighty fortress praise your voice now no love is greater who can stand against us if my god Are we working? Oh, yes. I don't need a microphone sometimes. Well, good morning. Welcome to church. Oh, oh, we're still here. Good, good. All right. Well, today is a great day. You know, every time the people of God are gathered, the Bible tells us that we gather around the Lord Jesus. So we're not here for ourselves. We're here to honour and worship our God and to build up the saints together. Now, we're uh, coming close to the end of our vision series, and this morning we're going to be exploring what it means to move out of our comfort zone. Now, that's got nothing to do with uh, the seat you're sitting on, all right? We're going to explore moving out of our comfort zone to intentionally placing ourselves in an arena of discomfort. Hmm. 
And we're going to see this is a real vision God has put, put on our hearts. And uh, the Holy Spirit's going to, I think, got a special word for you today as, as James opens the word of God for us. So, because God loves us, we want to serve him and love him and love others. So, um, before we go any further, let's pray. Our God and, Fa- and Father, we thank you that we can come here this morning to honour you, to lift up your name, to sing your praises. And I pray that your Holy Spirit might speak to our hearts and minds this morning. Bless our gathering and may we honour you today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me give you some community updates. We've got a few of them. Uh, Toys and Tucker, uh, if you've brought something for, uh, you know, for, to help people out, uh, there we go. Just on the table in front of the, uh, the sound desk, uh, you can place those items there uh, for that purpose. Now, I'm going to read something out, but I need a bit of an explanation first. The uh, leadership of uh, people in our Anglican fellowship uh, are ordained. They, they have hands laid on. We're going to see in Acts this morning that uh, there were deacons and uh, the apostles ordained them to a task. Well, we're privileged today and we, as a church, want to recommend Josh Wilson to the order of diaconate. So that's, uh, he'll, he'll be a rev, okay? And, uh, and that's going to be happening in February. Uh, by the way, there's two uh, orders, there's the diaconate and then there's the presbyterate, the eldership, of which uh, James and I have been ordained to that role as well. So, let me do the formal bit. I make no apology for the formality, you know, uh, except that most of us are too old to remember that there used to be bands of marriage read out once upon a time, it's a bit like that. Notice is hereby given that Joshua Wilson of this parish intends to offer himself as a candidate for the Holy Order of Deacon at the forthcoming ordination by the Archbishop of Sydney to be held at the Cathedral of St Andrew on the 17th of February 2024. If any person knows any just cause or impediment for which Josh Luke Wilson ought not to be admitted to that order, then such person should declare or signify the cause or impediment immediately to the Archbishop of Sydney. Okay, we got that out of the way. All right. Well, let me, um, let me uh, tell you about what you might have been given when you came in. You were given two pieces of paper, maybe many pieces of paper, but the first one I want to draw attention is this one here. Now, this, this piece of paper is an anonymous, but there's no place to put a name on it, okay? And uh, we're asking you to consider next week uh, your financial giving to the work of building God's people here at Life Anglican Church next year and the rest of this year. And uh, to that end, the, the uh, elders of our church are wanting to set the budget and the vision of our church and they want to know what sort of, you know, parameters we do that. And so, if you could, if you're married, talk to your spouse this week and pray about it. Uh, First of all, ascertain what you've given in the past 12 months here and what amount do you plan to give in the next 12 months. Again, let me say, this is anonymous, uh, but it's an appropriate expression of, you know, our faith and ministry as we want to grow the Church of God here. So, we've given it to you this week to look at for you to uh, get a form next week or bring that form in and uh, indicate to our elders where we're going, all right? Now, you're given a little postcard of, you know, uh, come uh, celebrate Christmas with us and that is certainly true We have so much to celebrate. Well, on the back of that form or card 
are the list of our Christmas celebrations. And the first one is on the 16th of December, uh, Carols at the Ponds on uh, Jonas Bradley Reserve, starting at 6 o'clock. We're doing a lot of the work um, on the platform this year. So uh, the music and uh, actually uh, is going to be led by James. That's right, yes. And uh, Josh Wilson's going to co-host the platform there. And uh, we just want to say this is a really good community event. And we, uh, in the past, a lot of people have gone to it. There's been a bit of a, you know, hiatus with the, you know, whole COVID thing, but it's back now. And uh, in the past, we got up to 7,000 people in that reserve. So it's a, a significant event, and it's Christmas, and uh, there are lots of carols, and uh, there'll be a, you know, a, a Christmas message there to bring your family and friends. And of course, there'll be food trucks and you know, all the other amusements are there as well. And uh, so, 16th of uh, December, it's a Saturday, starting at 6 o'clock. And also on the form there, and I'm not going to go into it, but there are all our Christmas and New Year's services there, all right? And because Christmas Eve is on a Sunday and Christmas Day is on a Monday, there's a sort of a, a funny little thing we pro- play around with church service times. So that's why it's in print, all right? So this is the opportunity for you to invite your family and friends. We have 10,000 of these printed off, all right? I want you to grab <clears throat> a small handful, no, a big handful, and take them home, give them to your family and friends and distribute them, you know, in your street. We want people to come and celebrate the good things that uh, we so cherish about the coming of the Lord Jesus this year. All right, that's it for community announcements. Let's uh, have a kid spot. Hello, friends. Hello. My name's Dan. Uh, I run the the youth church program uh, next door in St. Stephen's room uh, in our morning services, which is uh, years six to year eight. Uh, and I'll be talking to you a bit about what we do in there today, because it's always interesting. What do the teenagers do while we're in church? It's, isn't it a great question? Well, we're looking at the book of Ephesians, and Ephesians is written by this guy called Paul, and he uh, wrote this letter to the, Emph- the Ephesian church, the church in Ephesus, uh, in around 60 AD, to encourage them to keep living for Jesus, uh, to encourage them to be united as one in Christ. Uh, so we're going to think about that idea of unity today. So I'm just going to read this out to you. It's pretty interesting, right? So Paul says, as a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Paul is encouraging the church of Ephesus to be united. But united to what? That's the question. Well, this is the, this is the best part about the Bible. You just keep reading it. It tells you. The next part after this just kind of tells you there's a lot of ones, right? There's a lot of ones. It says there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope, when you're called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all. The unity is found in God. That's how the church of Ephesus are going to find their unity together. And it made me think of a, a certain type of picture of how the church works together. But because if you look around, we're not all the same. We don't really feel like one. But when we come together, we are one in Christ. We're one in God. And that kind of reminded me of a mosaic, one of those artworks that's multiple different pieces, all these different colors and shades all coming together to make one united piece of artwork. The unity of the artwork is done through the many single pieces coming together, and that's kind of how we work as a church and be united. We're united through being all different, but coming together as one in Christ. And as we think about our vision series for our church, I want you to be considering what it looks like for us to be united together as a church, even when we have different services and we have kids groups and uh, we have youth groups and all these things. How can we be united as one? And we're going to be talking about unity today with the youth kids. So I'm going to pray about that and then I'll send the kids off. So let me pray. 
Lord God, we thank you uh, for our church. We thank you that it is so diverse and so there's so many different people here, so many different age groups. Lord, I pray you'd help us to be united together and be reminded of what we are united through, through you, Lord, the one, the one God who we love. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, if you have kids who are in like pre kindy uh, we have a great uh, ministry for them. It's called Explorers. It's just up that way, out those doors and up the stairs into the greenhouse. If you have kids in years, uh, in like kindergarten through to year five, send them out the doors and around the greenhouse all the way up the side, and that's where uh, they'll do their kids club group, and in here uh, is youth church, year six, year eight. And if you are uh, anyone else, that's awesome. Uh, say hi to the person next to you, ask them how their week's been. From heaven's throne, he came to us for all our sin and our shame. He took the nails and took our place. No one else can do what God had done for us. Amen. Let's stand up and worship God.
from heaven's throne you came to us and set your heart upon the cross we'll never know the sacrifice you made for all our sin and all our shame you took the nails and took Father's arm is open wide. We'll come to the altar.
leave behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and drain them for joy From the ashes a new life is born And Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior. So let's spend some time in prayer.
Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we, on this Sunday we gather in your presence grateful for this gift of life and the opportunity to worship you together. And uh, we just fill our hearts with your love and grace as we seek to understand your word and what it means to us this morning. We uh, open our hearts asking you for courage to step out of our comfort zones this morning as we serve and worship you. Stir within us a passion for your mission that moves us out of our familiarity, prompting us to embrace new challenge and opportunities, breaking down the barriers of fear and complacency. Lead us into uncharted territories where your light and love can shine brightly. Grant us the willingness to be stretched and moulded by your transformative power, trusting that you are with us every step of the way. We want to thank you with gratitude for the ministries that seek to address the physical needs in our community, like the Bread of Life Ministry and the Toys and Tucker Drive. Bless these ministries abundantly as they strive to provide sustenance to those in need. And we thank you for the opportunity to serve and to be served, recognising that through these efforts, we can be vessels of your love in tangible ways. We humbly bring before you the wars and conflicts that plague our world at the moment. We pray for your divine intervention, that hearts may be softened, minds may be turned away from violence. Grant wisdom to the leaders, the world leaders, that is, guiding them towards paths of peace and reconciliation. Comfort those who suffer these consequences of this awful wars in the world, be it through the loss of displacement or fear, heal their wounds of the nations torn apart by strife and instill a yearning for understanding and cooperation. May your spirit of peace permit, uh, permeate these hearts, the hearts of the individuals and nations, fostering a world where justice and compassion can prevail. We lift up to you those who are facing illness and undergoing treatments at this time. Surround them with your comforting presence. Bring healing to their bodies, minds and spirits. Grant strength to endure the challenges of these treatments and the uncertainty of illness that it brings. May your healing touch bring relief and restoration and may those who are unwell find solace in your unwavering love. And as we approach the joyous celebration of Christmas and Christ's birth, we seek your guidance and blessing for the planning of all the upcoming Christmas services and events. May your spirit of love and unity inspire every aspect of these preparations. And may your peace reign in our hearts and may the message shared today inspire and uplift us. We thank you for the blessing of this day and trust in your unfailing love. Amen. Please open up your Bibles or Bible apps to Acts 6, um, verses 1 to 7. So I had a look at this before and it has a few names in it, so if I get them wrong, please <laughs> be um, gentle with me. So, the choosing of the seven. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man of full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Good morning. This isn't for me. It is not the right place anymore. We should go somewhere else. It's the wrong music. Uh, it's not my preferred preaching style. They don't use the organ, and I can't believe these songs that they're singing. The service is too long, the service is too short, the language is hard, the people are not like me. I don't like it when people dance. I don't like it that there is no dancing. I'm just not really comfortable here. 
I need to change church to find one that makes me feel more comfortable. Have you ever had that kind of thought or, or had a conversation along those lines with people? I want to find a church that is going to fit me and make me feel comfortable. I wonder if we have uh, embraced the culture around us, the culture of consumerism. And I wonder if we've applied that to church. You know, if we don't like our job, we change, uh, we move houses. If I'm watching a TV show and it hasn't gotten me in about the first 10 minutes, I'll do one of two things, my wife will tell me. I'll fall asleep or I'll just watch something else or I'll sit on my phone and scroll. That's generally a bad thing I do. But has this consumeristic worldview come into how we view church? For the vast majority of human history, your village was your village, and that is where you went to church. When most Anglican churches were planted around Sydney, they were planted so that everyone could walk to church. And then that wonderful human invention came along called the car. And we can choose where we go to church. And does that mean, then, that we deal with challenges and changes when they come within the church, or do we just leave to find something more comfortable? Uh, we are coming to the end of our vision series. Uh, we have seen that God loves us, that we're called to love Him, that we serve God, we serve one another. And last week, we looked at the story of the Good Samaritan, how we are to love people, even people who are not like us and our enemies. And today we're taking the implication of God's call to love our neighbor one step further. To be people who not just love, but are willing to share discomfort. Particularly as we seek to be a multi-ethnic church filled with people from different cultures, different uh, ethnic backgrounds, people who generally have different preferences of what that sacred hour on a Sunday morning looks like. And so today, the challenge will be for us to understand the hard aspects of being a multi-ethnic church and to be willing to share discomfort out of love for one another. As we do this, let me pray for us this morning. Heavenly Father, as we look at your word today, make us like you, people who are willing to love, people who are willing to love even when it is hard. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Uh, we're going to spend the majority of our time uh, this morning uh, in the book of Acts as we see this fledgling young church grow and spread, impacting different groups of people. Uh, and we're going to see how the gospel goes out and grows amongst people from different ethnic backgrounds. And we're going to see if the click clicky button will work. Uh, Daniel, if you can... Yeah, that's going to work now. Wonderful. Uh, first of all, we're going to see uh, what shared discomfort looked like in Acts 6, which Kelly did a wonderful job of reading for us. And starting in, in Acts 6, so in Acts chapter 6, verse 1, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Uh, the church was increasing, and back only two chapters earlier in chapter 4, the author Luke noted that there was not a needy person. But now, there is a challenge. This joy wouldn't last forever, because the church has grown, and there is conflict, which means that instead of the gospel continuing to go out, the church has to stop for a moment and look in and deal with the problem. There's some conflict. There's some discomfort between what's described here as the Jewish Christians that came from a Hellenistic background and a Hebrew background. So it's those Jewish Christians who are Greek and Israelite. They have the same religious story of being Jews uh, and then becoming Christians, but they come from different ethnic backgrounds. Greek and Israel. Maybe they didn't speak the same language. Maybe there was racism between the two groups, with the uh, Israelites seeing that they were the, the true people of God. And these two groups would have emphasized different 
cultural ways of doing things. And it meant that with the growth of this young church, there was discomfort and conflict. The Greek Christian widows were being overlooked. And so, verse 2, we see the solution. The twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God. The apostles decide to prioritize. There's only 12 of them, and they were trying to preach the Word of God and to take care of everyone's personal needs. But that last line seems a little harsh. It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. It feels a little harsh, doesn't it? But this is a really important moment for the young church. If the apostles had continued to have a split focus, trying to look after people's needs and trying to preach at the same time, I wonder, would the gospel have come to this northwestern corner of Sydney? It's because there is a priority to the Word of God. We are not a group of people that gather together on a Sunday morning because we all like each other very much. We are not the United Nations. We are not a a collection of individuals who who just like gathering together and singing some songs and, and having a cup of coffee after church. We are primarily, first and foremost, people, a church who gathers around the risen Christ Jesus. And because of that, others are chosen to come in and help. Verse 3, brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. How important that people full of spirit and wisdom are chosen. It is no easy task to care for people, let alone two different groups of people with different ethnic backgrounds trying to bring unity. And so seven Greek men are chosen, and we know they're Greek from their names. And they're ordained, just as Josh is going to get ordained uh, in a couple months' time. These men had hands laid on them. They were ordained for this task. Now, I don't know if that means that Josh should be uh, in charge of all of the food. Potentially not, I don't know. I think the people in charge of food are doing a wonderful job. So that this is done so the apostles can concentrate on preaching the word. And what is the consequence? Let me read verse 7. The word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. The discomfort and challenges between two different groups of people resulted in conflict. The conflict meant that there was a church meeting... The problem was dealt with and the church grew. We should not be surprised when people from different cultural and ethnic backgrounds come together that there is conflict. We should not be surprised when two people come together, there is conflict. Even when they are worshipping the very same Jesus. Because there's many different ways to express our worship of Jesus. There's many different music styles. There's many different challenges. And this little seven-verse story from Acts chapter 6 is significant, partly because it shows the priority of the Word, but it also shows that it is worth not just pretending that everything is fine. They could have just pretended, oh, that's okay, don't worry, you're fine, God loves you, we can all be together. It would have resulted in much bigger conflict. Instead, The challenges are brought out into the open and it is dealt with and then the gospel spreads. Brothers and sisters, be willing to share discomfort. Can you imagine how hard it would have been for those Greek widows to say to the apostles, hey, apostles, it really feels like the women who are from your cultural group are getting more food and we're being left out. For some of us, conflict is really hard. That would have been a painful piece of conflict to do. But instead of just one group carrying the brunt of discomfort and missing out, conflict brought resolution and the burden is shared. The New Testament shows how the church is to be willing to share discomfort. 
the discomfort to, that comes when people are together. Okay, so that is, that is our first piece. The second thing we're going to see is three uh, broader examples of uh, early church discomfort, particularly uh, that come from what a person is to look like, a Christian's identity, and what it looks like to worship God. And we're going to start with people. Uh, later in the book of Acts, in chapter 10, Peter uh, has a vision. And he saw heaven opened, and something like a sheet came down, and it contained all of these animals, and a voice said, get up, kill, and eat. And Peter is shocked by this vision. He, he responds, surely not, Lord. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. And you can hear Peter's shock at this. You know, God, I'm, I, I'm following Jesus, but I'm also a, a, a clean, religiously clean Jewish person at the same time. And God says, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. I am clean by the food I eat. But it is not that at all. It's that Peter is made clean by Jesus. And straight after this, Peter is requested to visit a Roman centurion by the name of Cornelius. And Peter goes there and he preaches and everyone is saved and the Holy Spirit is poured out on these people. And again, Peter is surprised. Verse 7 of chapter 10, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. Now, Peter is so surprised that he... He's almost like, oh, I can't believe it. We have to baptize these people as well. Even these Roman centurions, even these Romans can be part of God's family. Peter sees God inviting all people into God's family. And he's surprised. There's a moment of discomfort. But Peter, seeing what God is doing, is able to move past it. Having Gentiles come into the family of faith was one thing. But it was a constant challenge for the early church to see them as full believers without the requirement of them becoming culturally Jewish. A key aspect is that Jesus makes us clean. It's not about the food that we eat. But for Peter to be able to say, you are not like me and that's okay, what is most important is Jesus is a really important moment for this young church. We can be tempted to look down on people who are different. And, and on one hand, we can say, look, I agree, John 3.16, God so loved the whole world. I agree that Jesus is for the whole world, but I really struggle with this group of people over here. I'm not sure about these people. I don't know if they're really sincere in their faith as Christians. Now, we might not think that that really happens anymore. Racism, that's not really a thing. That was a long time ago. Uh, I've recently been reading uh, this book here. Uh, it's called Reading While Black uh, by a, a wonderful pastor, Anglican pastor by the name of Esau Macaulay, uh, detailing uh, the African-American's journey through slavery and Christianity. Uh, it's a really interesting and helpful book. Uh, he speaks of the hard times of African-American slaves only 150 years ago, 200 years ago, where church services were held, and often throughout the year, Paul's letters were read. And when that happened the white preacher would emphasize one aspect of Paul's letters. Be obedient to them that are your masters unto Christ. And so they were hearing on one week that there is freedom in God and you are set free and loved by God. And then on the other week, freedom is not actually for you. You are to do as your master tells you. What were they hearing? You are not as good as us. There needs to be some separation. You are not an equal brother or sister. There is a difference between types of Christians. Let us not be a church like that. Peter was surprised that God would invite the Gentiles into God's family, but it was only a momentary 
discomfort. Let us not be a church that makes a division between people, whether unintentional or intentional, but to love our neighbours as ourselves. And for some of us, that might involve questioning uh, our view of other people and our racism that we might not want to confront. The second example in the early church is the identity of people. Uh, In Acts chapter 15, the church in Antioch, the the place where Christians were first called Christians, which is uh, Antioch is in modern-day Turkey. Uh, This is a a growing and thriving church until some so-called Christians come from Jerusalem. And they say, Certain, uh, they said, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. You have to look like this particular Christian over here. You must do certain things, you must cut off certain things, and you must look exactly like this if you are a Christian. And so they take this back to the church in Jerusalem, uh, and the so called Christians are put in their place. And the Gentiles don't need to be circumcised. But this is a reminder that there can be an unwillingness to see Christians look different to how our culture expects them to look. In this case, there was a a legalistic push. This is what you must look like if you are a Christian. This is an issue of identity, not skin color. If you're going to be a Christian, you have to act like this, you have to look like this. Uh, at 7.45, uh, our earlier church service, I was talking to, to some people about what that used to look like in, uh, in an Australian and English environment. And I heard that, I don't know how many years ago, but women would have to wear gloves to church. Does anybody remember this time? Yes? And you don't have your gloves on today? And a hat? I know. Some people are wearing hats, but that's, I don't see many women wearing hats, actually. And so in that time, the identity marker, this is what a good Christian looked like. Gloves, hats, men were wearing ties. And now, and now, what are we wearing? Our cultural markers have changed for what a Christian looks like. But we are very good at saying, you don't look like the right type of Christian. We all have a particular view of what a good Christian looks like and what they should do with their time. It is far harder to focus on what is most important, Jesus. And let then there be a cultural flavor expressing our love of Jesus. When our identity is first found in Him, we get to express it in all kinds of different ways. And then when that happens, we need to be willing to share discomfort when that is happening in the same church. And so if you want to wear gloves next week, that's totally fine. If you want to wear a hat, that's totally fine. If you want to come to church in a suit and tie, that's wonderful. But as soon as we start saying, you must look like me, we're saying you must not look like Jesus. Okay. Third example of sharing discomfort is in worship. Uh, From Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he talks about discomfort between uh, the growing church in Corinth. Because some people uh, would often go to a, uh, a pagan temple. Because what used to happen was, if you wanted to eat meat, you didn't go to a restaurant, there were no restaurants. What would happen is, you would go and offer sacrifices to a pagan god, and then you would be allowed to eat some of that meat. And so that was, you know, first century Korean barbecue. And that was the way you did it then. And the problem was some Christians were continuing to do that practice. But they knew that that God was not important, and so it was fine for them. But others had an issue because they thought they were still worshipping another God. And so Paul says about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world. The food is not the issue. It is the working out of relationships with people who look like they're worshipping another god. And we're talking about worship and we're talking about eating meat. We will come to worship and music in a moment. But worship is, of course, more than music. Paul is clear. He wants the church to be thinking about each other, to be loving each other. 
And so he says, verse 9, be careful that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. There is an expression of loving your neighbor. It might be fine for you to go to one of these temples and to eat meat that's offered to an idol, but beware of the impact of somebody else who might actually think it is an act of worship to that God. But Paul, so wonderful is Paul, so encouraging. He is not like us. Uh, He is a wonderful challenge for us. He is so willing to share the burden of discomfort on the issue. He says, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. How many of us today would put up the hand and say, amen to that? If if, If meat is going to cause my brother or sister to fall, I will not eat it again. Anybody saying that? What if it was, you know, coffee? If, if, if coffee, co- my wife's laughing at that, I don't know why. If coffee causes my brother or sister to fall, I will never drink coffee again. I still don't see any hands. <laughs> what, what if I just said, uh, you know, not drinking coffee on the third Sunday of a Sunday of a month that has five weeks in it? You know, oh, I've got one hand. Okay, can I, that, this is wonderful. Paul is so seeking to love his neighbor, that he is willing to share discomfort. He is willing to sacrifice for the other. He says, I will change my preference. I will worship God in a way that is not my preference, out of love for you. Uh, Years ago, uh, Alyssa and I went to Nairobi. Uh, We worked at the church in Nairobi Chapel for a couple of months. And uh, it took me ages to get comfortable there. Uh, The the church services were very different. Uh, They would sing, and they would sing, and then they would sing. And all the while they were singing, they would also dance and dance. And then they would stop singing for a moment, and it would only be dancing. And if you didn't know, I'm one of the whitest men there is. And I found this incredibly uncomfortable. I found it hard. And then a couple of months later, we came back, At that time, we were at St. Paul's Castle Hill, a a church with a a rich history of writing songs and being a church that sings. And I was standing there thinking, why isn't anybody singing? Where's the passion? Don't they love God? Why is everybody standing so still? Where's the dancing? I couldn't understand. There are preferences and there are styles. And for both those times, going over to to Nairobi and coming back, it caused discomfort. But I should not expect everybody else to worship God in the same way. So we can say, do you know what, these songs we sing at church, they are not my preference. I don't really connect with this style of music. It's not my preference. Uh, Those sermons, uh, again, not my preference. I would much prefer to to do church with a meal after it. This Western way of just having morning tea, again, it's not my preference. Paul goes over the top, saying he would far prefer to change his preference. He would change the very food he ate, lest he cause someone to stumble. For the early church to grow, the people had to be willing to see what the main game was, Jesus, and his name glorified. If the church didn't share discomfort of people of different groups, different backgrounds and worship styles, then the church would never have spread. The love of Christ, dying for us and rising, calls us to love one another. And a key part of that is to enjoy and celebrate church, not as a a consumer, but as the family of God. Now, you've had a white guy talking about uh, people from different ethnic backgrounds long enough uh, we're going to welcome up Reggie. Reggie's going to come up right now. Let's welcome Reggie as he comes up. Thank you, dear brother. Hi, James. Uh, Reggie, uh, come, 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 come. Why, why don't you uh, tell us just briefly uh, about uh, yourself, your family, and and your family background? Sure. Um, so. I, uh, I moved to Australia with my family about 15 years ago, so 2008, June. Uh, my wife, Betsy, my two boys, Aaron and Adrian, uh, we moved from Dubai after spending about 12 years in Dubai. Okay. But 
as a background, we come from a, the southernmost tip of India, which, uh, from a state called Kerala. Okay, so you've been, you were part of the South Indian Church in Kerala? Yes. You've been in churches in Dubai? Yes. Uh, and you've been in churches in Australia, and now you're here at Life Anglican Church? That's right. What are some of the things you've had to be aware of as you've changed church in different cultures? Um, I think uh, the number of years that we've spent overseas, um, I think, made us mindful of how different cultures um, see either somebody from India or somebody from, from uh, the UK or somebody from Australia. And I think um, because we were aware of it, we were okay. But uh, I think there's a lot of times we wondered how we are seen by other cultures, what kind of traditions we have, um, what kind of food we eat maybe, or even what kind of worship we do at our church. So as, as you said a little earlier about the kind of music that's played here versus the kind of music that's played at, at the South Indian church, it's, I can't say it's extremely different, but there are times where... Uh, the traditional church in India follows a lot of chanting mm. and people just stand up and repeat after the priest or the minister, as we call it. Um, and we don't have that here. And, and to be honest, I found it easier to be connecting to this church than to, than to my own church that I grew up and my wife and I grew up with all our lives, right? So I think um, the challenges would be if people are not aware of, let's say they've, they've not really seen different cultures, they will find it difficult to leave their own traditional church and assimilate into a Western church. Mm. So I find I'm very happy with the music here, but I've always been happy with music wherever I went. But um, I think it's got to do with more coming in with an open mind and, and, being, um, and being accepting to, to this church and also making an effort to to talk to everybody around rather than say, I will only stick to this mm. culture or mm. this, uh, if I would speak to only Indians or if I would speak to only people from the Middle East, then that would be a problem mm. in, in trying to assimilate into this church. Yeah, thank you, brother. Uh, just briefly then, you've already mentioned a couple, but what are the joys then about being uh, here? I think the, the, the diverse culture, I've always enjoyed meeting people from different cultures and trying to understand what everybody um, how everybody sees life, right? Mm. And I think this particular church, uh, one, because it's just in my backyard, but, but secondly, it, it has more to do with, um, I, I love meeting people here. I mean, I meet, I meet a different person almost every, every day, but I think it's up to us as well, uh, coming in from a different culture and trying to assimilate into the environment. We need to make an effort rather than um, expect other people to come to talk to us, you know? So um, I, I just love it here. I mean, the, the welcoming culture we had, um, I think the initial, the first time I came and, and it was, um, I think, a message by, by Josh when he came in. I said, I, I sat up when he said, um, how have you, uh, so let's say that the time where uh, people have always said, uh, God will never give you more than what you can handle. And then I sat up straight and I said, I was listening to this, you know, and then he goes, well, it's all rubbish. You know, and then he said, "Well, God will not give you more than what He can't handle, mm. not more than what you can handle." And that's not something I saw in the church that I grew up mm. in, right? It was all tradition. You would you would always accept what the minister or the priest said, rather than question it, mm. right? Even the children found it very difficult, particularly from a language perspective, right? And when I look at our kids, uh, my older fellow's not here today, but uh, it's more about trying to give them the the. Um, that the spirit of, of what we're here for, right? Yeah. And not just go into church and listen to a different language and not understand anything. So I think, um, for me, that's the joy of being in this church. We understand. We can relate to what um, you or Jeff or Josh speak mm. to us every day and try to relate it to our daily lives. Wonderful. Thank you, dear brother. Thank that's you, right. mate. Thank you. Oh, thank no, I'm that. I'm that. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I think one of, the, one of the things that Reggie just mentioned then was for people coming in from a different background, having to be aware of it. And I just want to say yes, but also for those who come from the majority culture, it is really easy to be part of the majority culture and just to expect 
Reggie to come in, and Reggie's wonderful, and he's got wonderful, like, he just has such a gentle, wonderful accent. I just I love talking to him, and just expect him to come to me. But that is expecting Reggie to share the burden of discomfort and to not bear it as a church. Okay, seeking to be a multi-ethnic church, seeking to share discomfort is not easy. It's not easy. It is much easier to be a church that fits my own preferences. Other people, uh, if this church continues to reach out to this area over the next 10 years, this church will look different. And what is emphasised and what is celebrated will look different when we are still a Christian church, but things will look different as different people come in. And so there is a call for us to leave our comfort zones. Don't everybody go and leave your comfort zone and talk to Reggie. Um, Don't do that this morning. He'll probably love that, actually. There might actually be many of us who have borne that challenge of discomfort to join this church. Some of us actually need to look at our cultural sin that we are not aware of or do not want to confront. But these risks transform into rewards because God uses the process to transform us from a group of people to be a united church. Just like uh, Dan in the kid's spot before, he had a picture of a mosaic. How boring would the mosaic look if it was all one color tile? You do not get a beautiful picture unless you use different colors. And when we do this, we all flourish. And we can be a church that other people come to see how much we are united around Jesus. And so therefore, brothers and sisters, let me close. When uh, we sing a song that you don't particularly like, look around, see who else is singing it, and try and get one thing from that song about how great Jesus is. When uh, the aspect of the church is not your preference, we can still celebrate because this is a church family. When you feel discomfort... Feel that tension, but don't let that tension take you out the door. Remember the Jesus who endured much discomfort on the cross for us so that we could be part of his family. Let me lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love for us, that Jesus endured the cross to bring us into your family, a diverse family, Lord, Help us to be your family today, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us all stand and worship the Lamb of God who came down from the heaven's throne and suffered for our freedom. Yeah.
morning the Christian life is not about being comfortable in fact it is a measure of discomfort in serving him so as we encounter discomfort we know that the peace of God is with us and uh, may we go this week serving him confidently despite the challenges and discomforts you go through we're going to make a difference for him let me pray Father God, we ask that you would bless us as we go from here today. May we seek your glory and and your glory alone. And when we face difficulty or discomfort, may we even rely more upon you and build up your, your, your people. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. See you next week.